Hello, YouTube. You will notice that there is no music because you sent us mean, mean letters and emails. Hello, Zoom. Happy Friday night. Scotland Kiefer, first in the house. Peter Glick, Meredith Davis, Lee Dunn. Lee, with my eyesight so terrible, when I look at your name quickly, it looks like longtime cub Leon Durham, but I know that can't be right. Larry Rowe. Uh, winery extraordinary in the, in the house from Grayscale. Jan Kiefer, Scotland Kiefer, I already said hello to you. You two probably know each other. Chad Angelo, Ellie Sanford Moore, Eric and Lori Klein, seems like new people, could have been here for our last couple of sessions. I'm not certain. We're gonna let a couple more people come into the, to the room. And, and again, for those of you just joining, I apologize, we have no entrance music like we have in the last two episodes, because YouTube frowns upon that and sent us nasty emails. Uh, so, but later in the show, I'll be singing. I think I'm going to Leah, Larry, Kay Jurica, how are you doing? Jim Brubaker, the calm before the storm. Jim in Colorado and Chad in Colorado getting ready for just a wee bit of snow, somewhere in the vicinity of 48 inches or more with 30 mile an hour winds. Uh, there could be some drifting. But if I know Colorado weather, and I do, you could be golfing on Wednesday next week. So uh, I'm sure the ski resorts are very, very happy with this uh, dump. Holy cow. And I'm sure the skiers are very happy too. So that's fantastic. Golf Monday. Uh, golf Monday. Golf today. Jim, yeah, I like it. So we are going to begin... Uh, and welcome everybody. For those of you that are familiar with this, this is kind of an educational session. For those of you not familiar with Cellar Angels, Cellar Angels is a luxury high-end wine curator dealing exclusively with Napa and Sonoma wines. These are all limited production wines, typically not in the national distribution system, rarely available outside of the wineries mailing list or even outside of California. They're available on the Cellar Angels marketplace, our website, or via three different wine clubs. So you can come shop and peruse whatever you like, uh, but these wines are very, very high, hard or difficult to get. Uh, we like to feature them. And as we say all the time here at Cellar Angels, we drink very, very serious wine. We just don't take ourselves too seriously. So we, uh, I don't think we can begin because I don't see the greasies. And uh, the, okay, phew, where? They're four or five down online. Okay, oh, there we go, Jeff and Jane Greasy, because if it's sip 49, 49 weeks in a row, if it's SIP 49, it must be time to see the Greasies because they haven't missed a single episode. So Jeff and Jane, very, very happy to see you in the house. Uh, let us get over to the aspect that you are all here for. Tonight's episode is going to feature Cabernet Sauvignon, a, a debate that uh, is long ranging, very, very old. Uh, and we're going to do a lot of traveling. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Uh, first and foremost, the debate is, is really why is there a debate? And, and as we begin to, to jump into this, uh, we're going to let everybody or turn everybody's cameras on. So don't worry. Keep it clean. I know everyone's got yoga pants on, shorts, flip flops, uh, but maybe nice blouses and nice shirts. So we can make this more interactive. Uh, we can mute people if it gets out of hand, which is fine. Uh, but I am going to begin and Denise is going to start opening up some cameras so you all can see what I see. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this Cabernet Sauvignon debate. Julie Fogarty, good to see you. Scotland and Lily looking charmed as well. And by the way, not a single com comment yet. I dragged razors across my face and I have never felt anything so glorious as sharpened laser finished steel being dragged across my face to remove that mistake for three weeks. So uh, the beard is gone, kind of happy about that. Let's start at the beginning back in 17th century Bordeaux. Uh, it was a wild night. And so for those of you that know Van Morrison, uh, you should sing Wild Night with me because I, we can't play music because YouTube got mad at us. So, you know, uh, any Irish people in the house? Chad Angelo, I know you know this song. Everything looks so complete when you're walking down the street, things get wild. That's the extent of my wild night. But it was a wild night back in 17th century Bordeaux, all right? So you have Mademoiselle Sauvignon Blanc, Flirting, mingling, seducing, Monsieur Cabernet Franc. 
And voila, Cabernet Sauvignon was born. So uh, there was, I'm sure, a long cigarette smoked afterwards. I'm really taking a lot of liberties and hopefully not only will YouTube get mad at me, but the entire country of France will be sending emails. Uh, but that's literally how Cabernet Sauvignon was born. And in the chat line or in the chat screen, does anybody know what year the DNA testing identified that Cabernet Sauvignon was the offspring of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc? I can also sing the song of Jeopardy. Can you say it? 2010-ish, you, you do get credits for ish. I, I, I would like some sort of an exact, <laughs> what is, why doesn't someone just say uh, the 80s or 90s? <laughs> oh, Larry Rowe to all panelists. Look who grabbed their smartphone and Googled when did DNA. Larry Rowe is correct, 1998. Think about that. Just a little over, what, 22, 23 years ago was when we identified as a wine drinking species that this, in fact, is how Cabernet Sauvignon came to be. A wild night with uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc uh, tying one on and, and having some offspring. So, And I'm thankful for it. Several hundred years ago, uh, it, Cabernet Sauvignon is my favorite variety. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about where it's, th where it's thriving, where it grows, why it grows there. And uh, it grows in the old world, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Germany, France. It grows in the new world, basically North America, South America, New Zealand, Australia. It even grows in Canada. Uh, and one of the reasons why it does so darn well is its, it's skin. The skin is very thick on Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it likes gen generally, and that's the way it is, by the way, with wine. There's, there's no ironclad rules per se. It's always generally this. It's always uh, most of the time. But it loves sunny, warmer climates. It loves soils that have good drainage. Uh, and regardless, it retains those varietal specifics. So when you taste Cabernet around the world, you should be able to taste certain varietal attributes. And it also explains, since its versatility is so profound, why it is uh, hands down the most planted grape in the world. Uh, so it's pretty interesting just how a large distance it is between number one and number two. The varietal characteristics. When you have a glass of Cabernet, and I'm sure you all do, uh, you will notice characteristics dependent upon what country the wine is from that are fairly similar. You know, it's going to have a deep, dark color. It's going to have good tannin structure. It's going to have moderate acidity. When I say moderate acidity, when you think of some of the white wines like Sauvignon Blanc that have high acidity, it doesn't have that. It has moderate acidity. That acidity allows it to age gracefully. That acidity keeps in check and balance the tannin aspect. Aromas wise, kind of, you know, a, a good baker's dozen of aromas that you're going to get with cabs around the world. You get those dark spices, that cardamom, that cinnamon, uh, sometimes from the oak. And you get those dark fruits, that blackberry, plum, black cherry, black currant, all those darker fruits uh, that make Cabernet just, just so fantastic. That's all there. But then you get some of those secondary and tertiary flavors uh, or aromas rather. So, so think about, a lot of people have trouble with some of these second and tertiary aromas. So cedar. So if you have a, an uncle or a grandfather or you yourself are a cigar aficionado, you know, when you smell a cigar box, you, you get that cedar. You walk into a, a cedar closet type of thing and you can smell the cedar. That is also a telltale sign of Cabernet. Sandalwood, tobacco, leather. Le not leather uh, like uh, certain areas in Chicago off North Avenue, not that type of leather. Uh, I'm thinking leather like a uh, brand new saddle or brand new wallet when we used to have wallets and have a need for wallets because we'd go out, but now that we don't go out. <laughs> not the alley, yes, the alley. Thank you, Ivy. Absolutely the alley, not that type of leather. I'm thinking brand new saddles. You walk into a tack room and you smell the leather, fantastic. And then always uh, you can get that tertiary flavor of graphite, mocha, chocolate, uh, and in certain areas that will be more pronounced. We talk about the Rutherford dust in Napa Valley having a preponderance of that mocha sensation. Uh, that's a varietal characteristic of Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Uh, and yes, you can get some coffee. Thanks, Chad. Uh, foods. Foods that are high in fat. These are no brainers with Cabernet Sauvignon. So when you think about foods high in fat, not all meats work, by the way. Think about fatty meats. Think about great steaks that have a lot of marble. Think of filet mignon, by the way, not always an ironclad deal with Cabernet Sauvignon. Actually, there is an ironclad deal with Cabernet Sauvignon. Anybody want to take a gander in the chat on what is just basically a can't miss with Cabernet? I'm sorry, with filet mignon. There is a, per ah, Scotland Kiefer first in the house. Ding, 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 winner, Merlot. Merlot is just can't miss. Great Merlot is perfect with uh, a filet mignon. So, but when you're thinking big, big cheeseburgers, Chad, I can have you dismissed if you're not gonna behave. If, if, if you think of, of big juicy cheeseburgers with some gray cheese, like we have gray down here or cheddar, that kills with Cabernet Sauvignon. So that is a kind of a rough overview on Cabernet Sauvignon, where it's from, how it came to be, where it grows, varietal characteristics, foods to pair with it. And so now let's go take a look at the origin of Cabernet Sauvignon. So we've got a deep, deep dive for a, a big Google Earth session right now. So for those of you that have not attended our Google Earth sessions, we crisscross the globe. And it is not for the faint of heart. If you have a seatbelt, I encourage it. If you have an air sickness bag, it's nearly mandatory based upon some of the things we've done in the past. So let's take a look at France. But before we go to France, let's talk a little bit about the judgment of Paris. Two reasons why, because this is what exploded Cabernet Sauvignon on the map in California. Now, yes, they were, uh, the Martini family was uh, growing Cabernet Sauvignon. There was quite a few other folks, maybe a half dozen or so growing Cabernet Sauvignon in the Napa Sonoma regions in the seventies. They weren't fantastic wines per se compared to the caliber that they are today. But when the judgment of Paris happened in 1976, a competition between the United States and France pairing their best wines against our best wines and the, Fran and the United States winning, that was actually a contest put on by Stephen Spurrier. Stephen Spurrier was a wine shop owner in the UK, uh, one of the kindest gentlemen in the entire wine industry. And Stephen passed away this past week. So uh, it was very, very, very sad. I think in 79, 80 years of age. So it's unfortunate, but he is a wine legend and gonna raise a glass to Stephen because without the judgment of Paris, uh, we might not all be sitting here drinking Cabernet. The shot heard around the world indeed. All right, so let's go take a look at our good friend, the globe. So head nods, if everybody can see earth. No. Okay, so far that's working. Worked in rehearsal. Deck, can you see the deck? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way. I apologize. Good. There we go. Thank you. One of these days, we'll have a full top flight operation. Okay, so we're going to go to France, and this is the part I'm talking about where the air nausea can set in. So now I want you to take a, a long, hard look at Bordeaux and commit a few things to memory. Uh, namely, you have essentially two rivers that are combining just north of the city of Bordeaux and they essentially rush out to the Atlantic. You have an estuary here that has been eroded for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. And when you think about erosion of a river, down here, the city of Bordeaux, down here south of Bordeaux, you know, this is, it's a little bit bigger than a creek, but it doesn't have a lot of energy. So as a result, it can't move a lot of this soil on these banks. So what you have south of Bordeaux is a lot of gravel, a lot of rocks. The region is actually called Graves and Graves is short for gravel. So it's interesting when you look at Bordeaux or Cabernet Sauvignon, where the great chateaus are in relation to Bordeaux. The left bank, by the way, is very, very cab dominant. However, it is not the dominant grape in Bordeaux. The dominant grape in Bordeaux is Merlot and that's on the right bank. But take a look at this. So you've got Chateau Mouton, 
way up here, just feet off the river, Chateau Lynch Bage, feet off the river, Chateau Margaux, right off the river. These are all the dominant, you know, huge players of Cabernet Sauvignon on the right bank as it relates to the who's who of wine. And if I look as far south as the last great big chateau that actually produces world-class Cabernet Sauvignon with Chateau Haubriand, it's literally in, in almost the center of Bordeaux. There are very few, if any, chateaus that are producing world-class Cabernet south of Bordeaux, and it's because of the soil. So up here, you have all of that topsoil that's been eroded, and it's all clay down here. So clay, not very good drainage, but it has a lot of rocks in the soil, and those rocks heat up during the day with the sunlight. They help keep the vines warm at night. They help with the fermentation, or not the fermentation process, with the maturation process of the vines throughout the growing season. If we take a little look at the world famous, actually one of my favorite wineries in the world, Hope Rion, you can see that it is, if you thought that this looks like Wrigley Field, you're exactly right. Because look at this, it literally is a vineyard in the middle of a city, a sanctuary, if you will, surrounded by Bordeaux. And this, these are some of the most immaculate grounds, the most well manicured and attended to vineyard blocks on the globe. And yet they're surrounded by the city of Bordeaux. And if you get a chance to actually walk, and we can walk right through to Chateau Haubriand and see just how nonspecific and nondescript, look, they've got construction in France too, uh, just like the United States. Two seasons, winter and construction. But basically Haubriand, just sitting there, cobblestone entranceway, world-class, off the charts Cabernet Sauvignon producer. Uh, but again, along the river, clay soils, well-drained, uh, not a lot of high ele elevation. Uh, and, and it's interesting to see how much these guys produce as it relates to world-class Cabernet. Now buckle up, because we're gonna go to the wine region of which we're all familiar. Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley. So again, you've got a river. In Sonoma, you have the Russian River. In Napa, you've got the Napa River that runs right down the center of Napa Valley. So you have a huge maritime influence as we talk often. And you can see Bordeaux's got the Atlantic, Sonoma and Napa have the Pacific. Big influence. Both of them also are influenced via proximity to the San Pablo Bay and some of it via proximity and induction because throughout the evening, the, the Southern regions, Coombsville specifically, will suck cool air and fog right off of the San Pablo Bay and it just blankets the grapes. And the grapes, and it stays foggy in the Coombsville area much longer than it does in the rest of the valley. So when I look at Alexander Valley, I'm talking way up here in Sonoma. And when I look at Coombsville, I'm talking way down here. So this is about a 60 mile spread and over a mountain range. And it's, it's literally, it reminds me of Seattle to Miami type of thing. We were way up in the upper left-hand corner and way in the lower right-hand corner. But when you scroll down into Coombsville, you can begin to see the Napa River, not too dissimilar, bisects this whole region, pours out into an estuary, clears out all this area so that the soils are clay, right down to the clay here. And, and then out into the San Pablo Bay. The San Pablo Bay keeps us a very, very cold region, uh, very cold region, much colder than up north in St. Helena and Calistoga. So the first Cabernet we're gonna talk about, or I wanna show you before we get into it, is the Chandry family vineyard. So you can see where in Coombsville it is. It's also, if I am going to be sitting right here on this vineyard block and look over my shoulder, this is Chandry behind me. So now you can see the rolling hillside, which is what Bordeaux doesn't have a lot of, is steep hillside. Uh, this has a lot of erosion, similar to Bordeaux, but this, the soil structure is completely different because right behind me up here, is the remnants of Mount George, which was an active volcano, which blew its top. So everything in Coombsville around the region is a lot of volcanic rock, which is extremely porous, tons of drainage through that. And so it's also a great 
uh, area to grow Cabernet because the roots have to go down very, very deep to get nutrient and water. Uh, gorgeous, beautiful vineyard spot right here. The hills are very, very steep. And now we're gonna go all the way over to where the Yeoman Vineyard is in Alexander Valley. Another one where you're gonna to have to buckle up. Way, way north. And again, very, very similar to Bordeaux, just off a river. And you can imagine from a standpoint of the Russian river here, cresting its banks, hundreds, if not thousands and tens of thousands of times over a million of years and just depositing all sorts of soil, uh, shells, volcanic, limestone, clay, loam, all up and down this valley. Here you've got 101 and then you've got some of the steep bench lands right here, uh, which really comprise Alexander Valley. Long valley, narrow valley, uh, gorgeous kind of uh, topography, great driving up here, beautiful, but you can see not too far off uh, where the Yeoman Vineyard is for the Goldschmidt Cabernet Sauvignon right off the Russian River. So it's a pretty interesting comparison and contrast with regards to location, aspect, weather, climate, uh, and soil structure in relation to Bordeaux. Now the debate really starts with regards to debating Napa versus Sonoma. I'm not certain it, it's mandatory to, that you do that. Peter Glick, I forgot to say hello, good evening. Good to see you. Greg and Leah, I think I said hello, but good evening. Like to see that. Jim Brubaker's in two different screens. So I know how you do that, that's impressive. Someone's in the doghouse, but everyone's tuning in. I like to see that. Uh, so let's go back to what we we're talking about with regards to, we saw France. Uh, Napa and Sonoma to me is the greatest wine region in the world, just because of its diversity and the ability to grow so many different varieties. You know, Bordeaux grows five for the most part. They, as you remember from our, our blended discussion a couple of weeks ago, they have actually added new varieties in Bordeaux due to global warming so that they can have more vines and more grapes planted there, which is interesting. But Napa and Sonoma can grow so many different varieties because of the different soils, because of the different elevations, because of the different aspects and microclimates that I don't think Bordeaux can grow. Napa, 16 AVAs. And if you don't remember what an AVA is, American Viticultural Area, it is a process that you have to apply for as a region and you apply to the government that says this region is, is so specific and so unique and it could be elevation, it could be microclimate, it could be topography, it could be soil structure, it could be all of the above, but it's just so unique that you want a special designation class for your uniqueness. And that is called an American Viticultural Area. Within Napa County, there's 16 of them. Within Sonoma, there's 18 of them. So when you think about special, I always think the, the real estate example here is, is the most apropos. Uh, you know, New York's got five boroughs and, and while they're all in New York, there's five distinct boroughs that produce five distinct individuals. There's different dialect, there's different uh, energy associated with each one. It's not too dissimilar to AVAs within wine or AOCs in Europe. Uh, there is something unique about it. So it gets a special classification. As I mentioned earlier, the Coombsville AVA is the, the newest AVA in all of Napa. So if we take a look at that, yep, and your map did not come up. So let me double check why the share didn't work again. This, this one had a special effect too. It's kind of a kind of heartbreaking. Let's see this. Now you can see it. So Coombsville is down here as you saw, but look at all the other AVAs within the Napa Valley. And Napa Valley, by the way, itself is its own AVA. So you've got sub AVAs inside of Napa. Uh, similar to like you have the Gold Coast inside of Cook County. It's an AVA inside of Cook County or Highlands Ranch inside of Arapahoe County. I don't, don't quiz me on my Colorado geography there. I'm not certain if Highlands Ranch is on Arapahoe County. Hold all your calls. Uh, but you can see each one of these is unique in and of itself. Uh, Coombsville, the newest one, 2011. And it was interesting because Coombsville was sourced or a primary source for Cabernet Sauvignon for some big, big, big wineries. 
Staglin, Quintessa, Duckhorn, you know, Phelps, all of them used to source fruit from Coombsville, but not tell people it was from Coombsville. And the proprietors and growers in Coombsville got a little upset with that. And over the years, they decided, hey, our, our wine is pretty special or our fruit is pretty special. We need to start getting a special designation. And lo and behold, they petitioned the government, they filed applications, and in 2011, they were granted their own AVA. It's pretty impressive. So there's 16 AVAs in Napa. In the chat line, how many of those AVAs is Cabernet Sauvignon dominant in Napa? There will no issues will be allowed. Julie Fogarty going out on a limb, just, just rolling the dice and saying all of them are cab dominant. Jeff and Jane with all. Yeah, and then the price went up for grapes. Ever the economist, the winemaker, knows exactly the price of grapes. There's actually 14 of the 16 are cab dominant. There are two, what are they again? It's like deer something or other. And another one that are just, Carneros. and Carneros are not cab dominant. Uh, Carneros is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay dominant. Uh, but that gives you an idea of just how prolific Cabernet grows in the entire Napa Valley. It's 30 miles long, uh, wild horse, thank you. And 30 miles long, five miles wide at its widest point. But out of those 16 AVAs, Cabernet Sauvignon is the dominant grape planted in 14 of them. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive grape. Why I like Cabernet Sauvignon, especially from Coombsville. I jumped ahead to AV, Alexander Valley. Uh, supple tannins. There is, there's nothing astringent in the Cabernet Sauvignon from, from Coombsville. When you look at Howell Mountain and some of the Cabernets off of Howell Mountain, they're very, very tannic. They require a significant length of time to lay down. I don't have that patience. I want to drink the Cabernet now, maybe a couple years from now, but I'm not going to lay down a wine for 15, 18 years so that I can drink it. Coombsville, because of its climate, has great supple soft tannins and if you're drinking the chandra you know exactly what i'm talking about i mean this is a 2014 right now seven years of age uh tasting fantastic it's beautiful uh very very good mouth coating feel uh excellent aroma great concentration just a fantastic wine especially with seven years of age can easily age another 15 without a problem alexander valley became an ava in 1984 Think of that, you know, what is that, 27 years, 37 years earlier to give you an idea of just how long Alexander Valley has been making wine. I will click on this, it will not work, and then I will have to stop sharing. Oh, it did work, uh, it worked on mine. Didn't work on yours. No. I love when this happens. And it didn't pop up here. All righty. Oh boy. Here we go, much better. So here's Alexander Valley. And there's some sleeper, well, not really sleeper vineyards in Alexander Valley, but you just normally don't think of them because they have such prolific marketing machines. So you, you have obviously Silver Oak of Alexander Valley, right? So Silver Oak, very, very famous, fantastic winery. The Duncan family and the Meyer family has been making great wines for the better part of 40 years. Uh, a little bit over near Healdsburg, just outside of Healdsburg, you've got Jordan. Jordan, again, another marketing machine, making some fantastic wines. Simi. Simi has been producing wines in Alexander Valley since the 80s. As a matter of fact, Nick Goldschmidt, uh, who were featuring the Yeoman, Nick was the winemaker at Simi that basically put the Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon program on the map. So this valley is a long, narrow valley, and it goes all the way up past Cloverdale. But just south of Geyserville, uh, right on the Russian River, as I showed you, is the Yeoman Vineyard. Uh, Coppola's Vineyard is over here. So there's a, a lot of really small, Coppola, not small, obviously, but there's some smaller, limited production wineries here in this gorgeous mecca of a valley that produces world-class Cabernet. And for those of you that were on when we spoke with Knightsbridge Winery uh, in Knights Valley, this is the road we're talking about. If you were to take 128 and go over to Calistoga this way, you go through Knights Valley and it, it is one of the most picturesque drives in all of wine country in the world. It is just a spectacular wine 
winding road. You go through some of these gigantic evergreen forests and just beautiful bucolic vineyards along each side of the road. So I strongly encourage you, if you're staying in Healdsburg, this is a, a lot of fun too, to just jump out of Healdsburg, get um, a couple of coffees at the Flying Goat Cafe, and then just boogie on down here, all the way over to Calistoga and go to your meetings and tastings there. Uh, it's a fun drive, I promise you that. So now we've done Alexander Valley. We are gonna taste some wine. We're gonna assess some wine. You're all pros at this. Uh, is someone answering Jeff? I was going to. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Valley, just so you know, weather-wise, it is crazy how much rain Alexander Valley gets in the winter season. So think about it, after harvest, late October, the vine starts shutting down. So between October and say March, in the winter months, Alexander Valley can get 30 to 50 inches of rain. And, and that's a heck of a lot of rain. You do not want anywhere near that during the growing season. So what happens is all of those the aquifers get replenished. And you see a couple of lakes in the Alexander Valley area, they get replenished. And then during spring, it starts drying out. And it's a, it's a long, narrow valley, as I mentioned. And it's the valley, by the way, over Denise's shoulder. So you can see kind of that's where we filmed Goldschmidt and it's just fantastically beautiful. There's the Russian river over her shoulder on the side, uh, but the wind goes whipping through there a little bit. And that maritime influence day and night dries out the valley in spring, summer and fall. So when you have that dehydration, if you will, the grapes get a little bit more concentrated. The berries get tighter packed. And in that concentration of the berries, you get very opulent wine. I mean, if you've ever smelled Silver Oaks Alexander Valley, you know when you inhale that, it's just a, a fantastic aroma. I like the Alexander Valley from Silver Oak, by the way, better than the Napa Valley. And it's uh, $40 off, less a bottle usually. But uh, good, you know, pro tip there. The Alexander Valley Cab is outstanding. So that gives you kind of an idea of the growing area of Alexander Valley. And, and now we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive and we're going to do some tasting. So if you remember all of the cues for how to taste, assess, you remember that there's color, aroma, and palate. So you can turn on your mics. And if anybody wants to, I mean, we do color first, right? Against a white background. It's harder to do against a gray background, but white background works. Opaque. I like opaque. Mm -hmm. Dark purple. Dark purple. Dare I say deep purple? Dark, dark, <laughs> you can sing again, Martin. Dark, dark, dark. I can say book on the water. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, any maroon, any burgundy, any type of... Um... Mm. The edges are tinging just barely towards browner. Yeah, I, I agree, yeah. Definitely awesome. more, so, more so than the Chiandri, for sure. Mm. Awesome but catch. So than the Omen. The, the edge lightning, if you will, on the rim of the glass of the wine moving out from the center to the edge as the, as the rim of the wine gets lighter in color, even turns kind of a, it might turn a brickish amber or orangish, that is an indication of age, mm -hmm. normally. So as it gets lighter in color or more orange, it usually is older. Mm -hmm. So that's it, I think you've nailed color. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. Uh, aromas. Should we say thanks to John? <laughs> There are no wrong answers until someone yells apple. <laughs> really dark and earthy as compared to the uh, Alexander Valley Cab, for sure. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Plum, chewy. I'm sorry. Plum. Plum is all right. No. Blackberry. Mm -hmm. Blackberry ish, yeah. Dark. Dark fruit. Yep, dark red fruit. And I'm scrolling because I know, okay, so color, we have uh, deep garnet. 
gemstone. Oh, you got, oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Aromas. Mm -hmm. We've had some earth mansion, yeah, blackberry, right. blueberry, plum. You guys are professionals here. Mm -hmm. Tobacco, leather, all of those secondary and tertiary flavors we talked about. Mm -hmm. This one is exploding, especially if you were able to decant it a little bit beforehand, half mm -hmm. hour or so, this is coming to life in the glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. And tasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May have to taste oh, it two man. or three times. Four, five. Four or <laughs> yep. And blackberry on the palate. Really nice acidity. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. It's up there, but it's not. It's not stringent. It's. It's a. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, soft. Yeah. It's a more elegant wine. Yeah. Grimsville kind of produces softer, yeah. elegant, robust yeah. uh, tannins and flavors. I, I love the most elegant. Chad, where you, I was just saying, Chad, how do you start that sentence? I didn't hear the first part of your sentence. Coonsville. What, what, oh, just Coonsville in general. Okay. So it, I think you all nailed it from that standpoint. That was pretty darn impressive. The, and, and I like Chad's comment with regards to that softness and that elegant. Sometimes the word elegant is used as a, a deflection in wine to connote that it's, it's thin or it's, it's not powerful type of stuff. But more often than not, if you're using elegant, it, it has that silkiness, that, that, depth that luxury to it it's just a very elegant wine and and when it's made this capacity uh, as chad mentioned coombsville produces a lot of that elegant wine uh, this one is right in that so when you look at the chandry uh this is again right up the cellar angels alley right in our wheelhouse family run limited production uh there's the family Gorgeous area, gorgeous area in Coombsville. And you can see kind of that steep terrace right there on the hillside. Uh, and then when you scroll a little bit further down, they only made 275 cases of this. So not a lot. Uh, it is now, interestingly enough, it is 14.8 in alcohol, which seems high, but not a single one of you said, huh, a lot of heat, some burning, very low alcohol. Uh, and you know, and, and that's when we talk about harmony and balance. So you can have a, a you know, a relatively high alcohol wine, but if it's in balance, you won't even perceive that, which is fantastic. And also an indication of a well-made wine. And again, uh, this is seven years old now. They talk about being aged up to 20 years. So this has got a lot of staying power with this wine, super good wine. And here you get another indication of just how steep this hillside is down to the water, which behind me doesn't really do it justice. It's a significant wow. slope. Uh, Fairly old vines, not as old as what we're going to go to next. I mean, these are 15, 20 years of age, maybe a little older in some areas of the vineyard, uh, but just a sp fantastic property. They will do private tastings for Cellar Angels at the property. It's If you're staying in downtown Napa, you can miss the stoplight and be here in 10 minutes. I mean, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful place to come visit. And it is kind of interesting because what's neat about Coombsville is that most of the producers that produce wine out of Coombsville live there. So you will be driving by estates that there's no winery there because they're not allowed to because they're so small. Although we're working on that, we're making some strides with the mm -hmm. Save the Family Farms, but they all live in Coombsville. So a lot of times, you know, people will make wine in Oak Knoll, but they don't live in Oak Knoll because land is so ridiculously expensive. But you'll pass house or horse farms, equestrian areas, and stuff like that. Uh, those of you that know Le Chan Su, Le Chan Su is in Coombsville. Sue McNerney has a wonderfully beautiful estate. Uh, so. You know, gorgeous. So this Coombsville, I, I highly recommend not only for just incredible wines, but just really a, a nice, easy drive or bike ride uh, right outside of Napa. So that's kind of nice as well. But I'd be curious thoughts on on the Chandry. Nice. It's really, drinks really well. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. I definitely prefer this what, one. What was the answer? Question. I think it's always interesting that because they're, I mean, Rebecca's doing this with 100% Cap Sap, right? There's nothing else that she's 
introducing. There's nothing to, you know, she's not using the five nobles to, to play around with this a little bit, right? So it's just yeah. purely what the grape is giving, which is pretty cool. What the grape and Mother Nature, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. So now we're going to go to the other side of the valley, and we're going to go check in on Nick Goldschmidt. So this is the 2016 Yeoman. And, and Nick is a pretty prolific winemaker, makes wine in South America and Chile, uh, makes wine in New Zealand, his home country, makes wine in California. And, and if, if you, if you want to get a crash course in education, follow Nick Goldschmidt on Instagram. Uh, Nick is about as frequent a video poster as there is in wine. And his video snippets are minute and a half, two minutes, uh, which is just little fantastic educational gems and nuggets, little two minute vignettes. There was one the other day of him in the, in the vineyard pruning, talking about here's how many shoots I'm gonna get out of this cane. And he walks you right through the pruning process, wraps the cane around the wire, talks you right through the whole thing. It's just fantastic. I encourage you to, to follow Nick on Instagram. The 2016 Yeoman, uh, this, is a, this is a powerhouse, as you can tell by the bottle. I, I mean, you know, when you, when you put your wine in some, some heavier glass, we, we call it the steroidal bottle. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the winemaker, hear me roar. They want to make a statement with the wine or the glass, uh, which is great. I, I love it. It's a big wine. Uh, so I, I want to grab Nick's website. Uh, so go ahead and, and give that a little bit of a, a taste a swirl. John Hello, John Visley's in the house. Oh, he built you a fire. Oh, that is awesome. Fire marshal will be there momentarily based upon past fires I've seen at the Visley house. <laughs> <laughs> John's on a first name basis with the fire marshal, I promise you. <laughs> Uh, let me, so hopefully you've all got the, the Goldschmidt swirling around in your glasses. Oh, and a cigar. I like it. You're not tasting Pinot Noir this evening, I see. <laughs> Chardonnay. I like it. Look how beautiful it is right there uh, behind the Visley house and outside of Healdsburg, very near the Alexander Valley where we were just looking. Yeah. Yep. So let's take a look at this at this yeoman. What do we have for color? You have to turn your microphones off. These aren't colors. Um, it's younger. Yeah, only really younger. Yeah. Darker and consistent all the way to the rim for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Say the same thing. It's interesting that consistency, and it's only two years younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get, an idea, you get an idea of what can happen, you know, from a color standpoint, when the color can sort of fall out in just two years. And even the, the Chandry was it's still pretty concentrated. Uh, when you start getting into older vintages, oh, yeah. you know, 15, 20 years, that's where the color really gets light at the edges and turns yeah. orange. And it's, it's just fascinating. So we've got what colors? Purple. This is some ruby. And there's precious little of each of these two wines left. So I apologize for that. 12 <laughs> bottles left of the Goldschmidt and only seven bottles left of the Chandry. No. <laughs> uh, they go fast. Six. So ruby. All right. <laughs> oh. Very deep, deep, very, I like this one, deep red. <laughs> There's not a lot of, we don't have to get superfluous with a lot of these, right? It is what you see. Damn, I don't get beer beer. Yeah. Aromas, ripe black fruit, cigar box, that's two in a row. We talked about cigar box uh, with, with kind of that cedar leaf. It could also be because John's smoking cigar, so we've got this new feature, smell a vision. So you could be saying <laughs> it's, it's Wonka vision. Green pepper or I dated myself. <laughs> the I palette. smell the oak. Smell the oak a yeah. lot more. Wonka vision. 
And it's interesting because we're we're going to do. It's so funny. We've got a couple of sessions coming up in the future where we're going to talk about some of the the finer tools of winemaking, and barrels are going to be one of them. And we're going to do kind of a deep dive into barrels. So that should be very interesting because you'll get a, a major impact and exposure on what's happening with the wood wood treatments. So yes, this is ripe black fruit, you know, which is exactly what you get out of Alexander Valley. Jim, are you talking to me or? Jim's talking to, talking to the waitress. I'm just, <laughs> he's at a restaurant. Black cherry, leather, and again, velvet tannins. That should be the name of a band as far as I'm concerned from the 70s. A punk rock band. So is there a... You, you nailed the color aspect with regards to, and the, and the aromas and the age, which very impressive, but I'm curious if there's a flavor profile that speaks to you more than the other. Yep. Is there anyone here? You might have to go back and forth a few times. It's okay. between the Chandri and, so is there one that, are they both fantastic? Are they both, I'd be curious, have you had either of these before other than through Cellar Angels? Was there anything, is, are you eating something with them or is everybody in the typical American fashion just, just having wine? <laughs> More burly tannins on the, uh, the Goldschmidt. I kind of really noticed the kind of mouth drying effect. Hmm. And yeah. ask him. Does the Chandra seem sweeter in that capacity? Mm, I don't know because of the oak on the gold. That has a little bit of that sweetness from the oak, I think. Hmm. Mr. Angelo, tell yes, me sir. about the Sutter Home White Zen. What do you? What do you? What do you? What are you getting? <laughs> A, a little Kool-Aid, um, <laughs> a little uh, rubbing alcohol. <laughs> and some turpentine. And, and, that turpentine right, yeah. and rounds out the finish. Yeah. I love it. Uh, so, Mr. Greasy, anything on your assessment, pros, cons, favorite? I think we started off um, maybe preferring the Goldschmidt. But now we've drifted more, and I think it's Chandri is is winning out the the night tonight. So they're both good. Any of them out. Yeah, I wouldn't throw them out for sure. <laughs> you probably won't be using the report again tonight. <laughs> Same. Same. So, someone very someone very famous I know said report is for quitters. That's right. <laughs> Not such a thing as leftover wine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's an oxymoron, Jed. <laughs> exactly. You know, hey, Jerrica, what, go ahead. I'm sorry, Peter. I would almost detect caviar, hints of caviar. Where, Jim, in which where? one? In the uh, Goldschmidt. But, like salty? Yeah, like, like almost like a slight hint of salt and just, that, you know, the uh, a little bit of sturgeon. I was going to say beluga or sturgeon. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to try both, Martin. I'm going to Naples, and I'm going to try. That that can be arranged. Yeah. They yeah. do that down here. So mm -hmm. that's interesting, though. So kind of like a salty component. Yeah, I mean that's like a very aftertaste, a very little bit of it. Yeah, interesting. Nice. Because I, I can totally appreciate that on you know some of the whites from Greece and some of the whites from Albarino that are in that Rias or the Albarino from Rias Baixas area that are right on the coast. And it's amazing how you can perceive that that salt water. It's the minerality in the soil. You're just really there picking up just a little yeah. bit. Very yeah, nice. We're, we're picking that up, Peter. We, we get what you're what you're saying. All right, Kay, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You have to unmute. Okay, I like the Goldschmidt better. Ah, okay. And why? 
I don't I think it's um, more earthy. And I like that flavor. Very nice. Good, good, good. <laughs> Greg and Leah, any thoughts? Well, we opened them both last night um, and we liked them both, but lean a little bit more toward the Chiandri and we had them with steak tonight. Um, but I like the Goldschmidt a little bit better with the steak when we were, when we were pairing them. So they're both delicious. That, and what kind of steak? I like a ribeye. There you go, perfect. No, that's interesting. And, and it's kind of fun too, when you come back to it a day later and, and taste it again, side by side, it's completely different. And so Jeff, I think it's fascinating that you started out liking one and then within the span of 45 minutes or so, it's like, oh, hang on, now this one's actually growing on me, uh, which is, I think the beauty, not only of wine, but of, of, of good wine from that standpoint is that it evolves. And, and that's one thing, it's, it's fascinating to me that where you try to assess wine and, and what we're tasting right now is a snapshot in time. And, and it's hard to put a score on that. It's hard to put a, a definitive descriptor on that because that snapshot in an hour, in a day, in a year is going to be totally different because it's a living, breathing organism. So um, that's one thing we have to keep in mind because if it's if it feels tight or too tannic, you know, it might soften in, in six months or a year, but it, it's always evolving. Uh, so this little fingerprint or snapshot this evening gives us a little glimpse into that. So given there's two you know, years difference. In advance, you think it could have gone more? Oh, I'm sorry, Peter, rephrase, say that again. Because in your email, you said open an hour before. Is that Was that enough in hindsight? It might not have been, I, I think it's enough for the Chandry. I, I think it's fine for the, the Goldschmidt. I mean, an hour for a Napa cab uh, that's 2014 should be plenty. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't hurt if you opened it up an hour 15. Uh, but I mean, it's a 2014, it's seven years of age. It's, it's not one of those gigantic uh, tannic thing, you know, like a Bryant family or any of those ones that are just so overtly big that it needs more air. Uh, so I think that should be fine. But the, the fun of these is to open up the wine and taste it slowly over a few hours so that you can really taste its progression. If you can make it last that long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd be curious how much of the bottle was gone before the hour started. Uh, that's, that's the hard, yeah, it's, Peter, that was our hard challenge. If we open it up too early, no one has any wine left before the program. <laughs> You but I think that that's a that's a good point uh, with regards hey, to decanting. Hey, Martin, do you think that I mean the Chandry's two years younger? Where do you think it's going to go in two, or older. older? No, yeah. yeah. So where do you think it's going to go versus say where's the Goldschmidt going to go in a couple of years? If they were if they were both fourteens or if they were twelve, any sense of that, or is that a little hard to know? No. Well, that that's actually one of those. That's the fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar question, which is why right. every every critic actually gives a range because you don't know when it's going to peak in that range. It's such a crazy thing we do with regards to, to rating wines in that capacity. Uh, optimal seller conditions, all of that sort of thing. I, I do think both of these have easily seven to 10 more years on them, both of them with, without a problem. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, the Sandria is so soft already that it's just going to get softer. I don't know how you make silk softer, softer, inventing words now, more soft. Uh, but, but you get the idea. It's, you might get more fruit or the fruit will soften. I think the yeoman will soften for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. <clears throat> what I was else? Also curious. Hey, Greg and Leah, you guys, you drank it straight up last night and you, you paired it with food tonight. I'd just be curious, was there anything different you know, did because I often find you know wine drinks so different when you pair it up, right? So I'd just be curious if you, know, you guys just sat yeah. back down. But, you yeah, know, you I, find? when we first opened them and we drank them right away last night, I thought the tertiary flavors in the Chiandre were just better. Um, I think it was oaked less, if I read it correctly, and uh, like in oak for a less amount of time. I think it was twenty four. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt like the flavors were more like vanilla and things I, that I like in a wine, whereas the Goldschmidt was, to me, came across a little more woody or oaky. But today, when we had it with the ribeye, 
the Goldschmidt just was, it was delicious with, mm -hmm. with it. The, the oak flavor that I got last night was a little bit more of kind of like cedar notes. Um, I think for us, it just, it just took a little time to kind of evolve. It was delicious with the ribeye, I thought. Mm -hmm. Cool. But don't forget the chemistry in your mouth is going to change. And, um, and, and, and somebody said earlier that one of them seemed a little bit more, uh, a, a little higher in acid. And that acid is going to help that wine age. Yeah. Uh, if you have a low acid wine, it's not going to age as long. So uh, between your mouth chemistry and the amount of acidity, it's definitely going to change over the next, next couple of years. Mm-hmm. You no, know, great point. And, and actually, Larry wrote, by the way, uh, John Visley, winemaker at Visley Vineyards, Chad Angelo, winemaker, owner at Angelo Cellars. And also in the comment line, we've got Larry Rowe, uh, who is the owner at Grayscale Wines. So so, so three, and, and Larry now just brought his, got out of witness protection and is free to turn his camera on. Uh, but, but Larry has a... Larry has a good point with regards to aging wine and seeing how a wine develops. And it's, there used to be an age old principle when, when purchasing wines, you, you buy three cases at a time. You buy one to gift, one to drink, one to age. And, and you can do that from a capacity, you know, over time, over 10, 12 years, the wine's going to evolve. So Larry, I'll let you talk about buying 12 bottles and opening one a year. Yeah, I, this is something that, that Jeannie and I started, golly, I guess we've been doing it almost 15 years now. Uh, we will buy a case of wine and then open one bottle at, at some point in the year and write notes on it. And you can kind of watch what happens to the wine over time. And you go back and look at your notes and you say, oh, gee, did I really think that then? It doesn't look like that now. And it's amazing how much they will change. And John's comment is absolutely right. Acid, acid is really, really important for long aging wines. And so in a young wine that's really acidic, you kind of just say, well, okay, it's going to take a little while for that to work its way out. So, but yep. it's a good thing to do. G, G and I have three, three different uh, series that we're working on and we've, we've just finished one and we're about to try and figure out what the next one is going to be. It, it's very educational. It re, you'll learn a lot. Yeah, it's a tremendous methodology with wine. It does not work with tequila. Uh, I would not, <laughs> would not try. Yeah, but the tequila doesn't age that much, does it? Yeah, no, it does not. Uh, Eric and Lauren, I, I don't know who gave you that case of wine with those instructions, but those are great instructions. That's too. A cool idea. Uh, they got a wedding gift to try one bottle a year. It was the year of our anniversary, it actually, and it actually came from my parents. It's actually an anniversary gift, I suppose. Yep, nice. Very good. Awesome. I know that's great stuff. And yes, Chad, not white Zen. I totally agree with you. You cannot do that with white Zen. You can remove the uh, finish off your car though with it. So there is <laughs> multiple uses throughout the years. So let's uh, move on. So you've done that. We have, I can't even see my deck. A lot of things. Was there a favorite? We went through that. Next week is going to be French origins. Cabernet and Pinot Noir, and we're going to go deep into both of those. And it's fascinating because those are two of the most famous wine regions, but man, they are completely different. And, and they're different from uh, climate. They're different from vineyard appellations. They're different from history. They're, they're different from how they grow, who owns what. And it's not unusual in Burgundy to have 50 different owners of a single vineyard. Uh, so it's crazy in that capacity. But for this evening, you have all survived. And uh, I don't know if there's any other questions or anything, but I cannot thank all of you enough for spending some of your Friday with us. And, and hopefully that you can continue on and, and stay healthy and smile and go refill glasses. And I, for you folks in Colorado, stay safe. That's all I got to say. I mean, that's very yeah, warm. Cheers I don't know all. many. I don't know many people that fifty inches of snow they handle well. Mm -mm. <laughs> Cheers. But you guys be good. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see Cheers. you next week on SIP fifty five zero. Thanks, Martin. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Martin. Bye.